Well, thank you for joining today on our Side by Side, and we're going to be thinking this next few days about our senses. Well, when I talk about senses, what I mean is our sight, our hearing, our sense of taste and smell and all of these things, which go to make to make us in many ways part of who we are. They are gifts given to us. I wonder, what of all the senses that you have would you miss more than any other? Most people don't need to take too long to think about that. Uh, I think maybe for me, my eyesight would be perhaps the one I might miss most. Hearing is another one I think would be tragic if I could never hear the beautiful sounds of music and the sounds around me of birds and, and people speaking and so on. But recently in the COVID, and presently in the COVID pandemic, anyone who has experienced it may well have had the loss of taste and smell to accompany that. I know that I had that experience and it was a very strange thing. It didn't happen at first, but it happened maybe after a few days into the process, when absolutely no smell and absolutely no taste, everything was the same. It didn't have any taste, in fact. You could go cold or hot, but that was about it, rough or smooth, nothing else. I even saw a man who, months after it was put in, chilies, hot chilies on some of his food to give him the least hint of a taste. And it certainly was tragic if you think about it that all that lovely food that is made and, and, and a great part of it is the just that impact of the various tastes, the sour, the sweet, the bitter that make it what it is would be lost. But think about seeing first of all. That's the one this morning that I want us to think about. Last week, as we were thinking about Luke 24, seeing was quite a crucial part of the whole, the whole passage where Luke was trying to teach us and he was relating about how people came to see Jesus alive. And it wasn't just that they saw him physically before them themselves, but they also saw inwardly what it really meant. And that's where we ended up as we were going back into the Old Testament to see how where Jesus had spoken about how the scriptures in all of the scriptures, he is to be discovered. You can see his, his life and his death and his resurrection are all there. But now I just want for a few moments to think about sight in the way of physical sight. There are two people who I've read about who lost their sight. One was Helen Keller. Uh, she lost her sight when she was an infant. And so she had no record of having seen anything. And yet she was able to learn uh, to, to read and write through the special means that were given to her by special training and teaching in the blind school that she went to and her special teacher. She went on to have a, a very full life and to engage with this world, even this physical world, in the most profound way. And she left a marvellous legacy in so many ways behind her. She wrote these words and these are words for someone who has not seen what she writes about. But listen to them and, and you'll see them because they, they are things that you may have seen. Have you ever, and I quote, have you ever been at sea in a dense fog when it seemed as if a tangible white darkness shut you in and the great ship, tense and anxious, groped her way toward the shore with plummet and sounding line and you waited with beating heart for something to happen? I was like that ship before my education began. Only I was without compass or sounding line and had no way of knowing how near the harbour was. And I end the quote. What a very, very descriptive way to speak about her journey for someone who has not heard or seen. And yet I suppose I was a little bit disappointed to, to discover that Helen chose a kind of form of faith known as Swedensborg, uh, so called after the name of the man who was the founder of that, a kind of a Christian universalism where there's no such judgment. Everybody seems to be included no matter what. However, I'm sure she was a very exceptional person on many levels. But then you've got another one, and that's Fanny Crosby. At the age of eight, she was able to write her very first poem that describes her condition. And later she then says this 
And these are marvelous words. She says, it seemed, and I quote, intended by the blessed providence of God that I should be blind all my life. And I thank him for the dispensation. If perfect sight, earthly sight, were offered me tomorrow, I would not accept it. I might not have sung hymns to the praise of God if I had been distracted by the beautiful and interesting things about me. And by the end of her life, she had written almost 9,000 hymns. And uh, it is estimated that books containing her lyrics sold 100 million copies. Maybe you're aware of at least a couple of her hymns. One is Blessed Assurance, and the other one is Give Me Jesus. And these make the point that just because we cannot see physically doesn't mean that doesn't mean that we're any less able to see the goodness and grace of God. And in fact, I think in some respects, maybe even have deeper insights. Having said this, let me consider the sense of seeing a little bit further. First of all, eyes can be a source of trouble. There's no question about it. Genesis 3, 6 reminds us, as we read there, that Eve, who when she saw that the tree was good for food and that it was a delight to the eyes, she took and she ate. And so in that perfect place, with perfect eyesight, with her capacity to choose, she, through what she saw, she went in the wrong direction. And we have all been paying that price ever since. Matthew 18 and 9 reminds us that this is still a, a very moot point, for it says, if your eye causes you to stumble, it's better that you take it out, throw it away. It's better for you to enter life with one eye than have two eyes and be thrown into the fires of hell. Indicating, yes, those physical uh, senses that we have, those gifts that we have, can become a, a negative thing and a disadvantage. But then, of course, eyes are a great source of blessing. Think, for, think of the 121st Psalm. I lift up my eyes to the hills, meaning that the things around me inspire me to see God and praise him. Romans 1, 21 puts this, also in the same way, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen. And Jesus rebukes the disciples after the feeding of the 5,000 when they're still debating. He says, have you not eyes and have you eyes and you do not see? In other words, did you not really, what did you not, what did you learn when you saw, you saw the miracle? So thinking about this a little further, I think when we think about the use of our eyes, first of all, maybe we should begin by praying, open my eyes that I might see the wonderful things, not only in your world, but in your word. And if this is a genuine prayer from a humble heart, it will be answered, and we will be granted a better, clearer vision of what God has said. And I suppose, having prayed that, it may lead us then to read more slowly, more carefully, more regularly, more prayerfully and maybe with others, so that we can have the benefit of their eyes as well. But it also reminds me not just about what I see, see in Scripture, but also what I look at with my eyes. Secondly, I'm thinking about that Psalm 101 verse 3. It says, I will not set before my eyes anything that is worthless. And I think all of us regret having times that we allowed certain images to come before our eyes, watching something that was not really very edifying, Something that was maybe impure, Philippians 4, 8 comes to mind, where we read about, you know, whatever is pure and lovely and good and true and so forth. Think on these things. I think many of us would be spared lots of troubles if we would be more careful about the things that we allow our eyes to ponder over. And then finally, I think about Jesus' use of his eyes. Matthew nine thirty six says, When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus' eyes, he used his eyes to absorb many things. But among the many things that he saw were the needs of people. Yes, he saw the hypocrisy. He saw the violence and the hurt and the shame. He saw the wickedness and the sin of man. He saw the many things that he converted into stories and parables. But it's very clear that he saw with compassion and I think that's really helpful for us because there's nothing in our lives of all of our senses that is disconnected to our hearts. And of course, the heart of Jesus, that's the seat of desire and will, is the most pure and holy and it always produces most wonderful results. And if we are his, then surely we will look as we say, let me see with the eyes of Jesus and see the way Jesus saw. 
and, and we will see the world differently. So today, I just pray that you and I will be able to see with the eyes of Jesus. Think about our eyes and pray about our eyes. Maybe you've never done that in your life, but why not do that today? Pray about the use of your eyes. What a gift they are. And if you don't have sight, then I know that you're praying for the use of that insight that God has given you and other gifts besides. We need your help just as much as we need all the other things.